Good morning, everybody. This is uh, the Instituto of Astrophysica Andalusia series of colloquia. And today we will have the talk <clears throat> by Dr. Robert Beswick. And he will talk about star formations and accretion in galaxies from near to far, the Lee Mining and Emerge Emerlin Legacy Program. Uh, Dr. Robert Beswick will be introduced by Isabel Marquez. Please, Isabel. Hello, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being in here again following the uh, Severo Ochoa Colloquia at the Instituto de Astrofisica Andalucía. And uh, thank you very much, Rob uh, uh, Beswick, for accepting our, our invitation. I hope that uh, it'll be possible to do in an in person visit uh, when, when, when it will be possible but not, I mean, sooner, the, better than later. Uh, Dr. Rob Beswick is currently a reader in astrophysics, acting head of the Sun, Stars and Galaxies Research Group at the University of Manchester's George Roll Bank Center for Astrophysics. And he's also head of science operations and user support team for the UK's National Radio Astronomy Facility. He completed his, uh, his PhD in radio astronomy at George Roll Bank Observatory in 2002 and has been an active researcher in extragalactic astrophysics ever since. His personal research spans galaxy evolution, transient astrophysics, and interstellar medium physics in external galaxies, and has resulted in over 250 publications. Uh, Beswick has a leading role in a number of high profile large research consortia, exploiting multiple large facilities around the world. He is a strong advocate for the Square Kilometer Array and has previously chaired SKA science working groups. Rob leads and participates in various activities in large international consortia aiming to enhance astronomical facility access and services. Most recently, this includes coordinating a 2 million euro joint activity to improve and harmonize the provision of user-facing services across multi-wavelength astronomical facilities in Europe within the 15 million Euro, Euro Horizon 2020 Optical Radio Net pilot program. Alongside these research and facility operational roles, he's a strong advocate for the use of radio astronomy to aid development around the world via STEM skill training. He contributes to various overseas development projects, focusing on the provision of science, training, and education in developing countries from Sub-Saharan Africa to Southeast Asia and Latin America, as well as Europe. These include the development in Africa with radio astronomy, the uh, uh, DRE project, which is a UK South Africa funded program to train the next generation radio astronomers in sub-Saharan African countries. And the Horizon 2020 funded Jumping Jive program, where he leads a work package that is advocate for the development of VLBI within Africa via STEM training. These projects have multiple goals, including aiding sustainable economic development via enhanced education and opportunities, industrial connections and opportunities, as well as providing a human capital platform for the development of future large-scale research infrastructures, such as the African VLBI network, and ultimately the phase two of the SKA. In today's seminar, Rob Beswick will describe the latest results from two of the largest extragalactic legacy programs to be ever undertaken with the UK's Emerlin radio interferometer with a results view of star formation and accretion in galaxies from the local to the distant universe. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation, Rob, and the, the, the board is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the introduction. I will just share my slides. Uh, so hopefully you can see my slides now. Um, so thanks again for the introduction and the invitation. It's a real pleasure to give this colloquia um, where I'm going to focus a little bit on some of the work that we've been doing in the field of galaxy evolution um, with E. Merlin and other radio telescopes, as well as the multi-wavelength view that accompanies these surveys. Um, so as as this talk goes on, I'm going to initially describe some of the um, motivations for doing these programs, but then also 
dig a bit deeper into the initial results that are coming from both the Lemming survey and the Emerge survey, which attack this problem of star formation and accretion in galaxies from two different angles. One looking at the a sample of local galaxies and another looking at deep field analysis of, of radio emission um, out to redshifts of several. Um, where we can use the high resolution radio observations that we are making to disentangle the star formation and accretion within the individual galaxies that we're surveying. So, first of all, um, so what I'm going to present is, is much work from many, many people. Um, and I think it is incredibly important that we uh, acknowledge that. And many of much of the work that has been undertaken within the Lemmings and the Emerge Consortium has come about from the work of a large number of very talented PhD students, master's students, and postdoctoral researchers over a number of years. Um, I can't name all of those people in, in one slide, but um, I've listed a few of the key people that have contributed, and they've contributed both in the science exploitation, the development of the programs, and the data analysis. And we're talking a large amount of radio data that has gone into these individual surveys. Um, and it is important to credit those people throughout. The two consortia, the Lemmings and Emerge Consortia, are both large international teams with many tens of, of researchers from all around the globe but this work could not have been done by without the early career research scientists work that is really fundamental to the things that i'm going to present here so in any of the slides if i haven't given credit um, these are the people that actually are due the credit rather than myself okay so first of all an introduction so i'm going to give a very very brief introduction to the motivations for some of the surveys that we are doing here and bringing these two different research programs together to allow us to try and give us a more broad understanding of accretion star formation processes within galaxies across a wide range of redshifts the key theme here is resolution um, and i'm gonna rather unashamedly I bias myself towards radio observations and high resolution observations. And the reason to do that is that has allowed us to really separate out the physical details within those individual galaxies. So as most people um, who study, many people will know already, what we have across the universe is we have an evolution of star formation and accretion, which peaked at the cosmic noons of around one to three, a redshift of one to three, where we see a peak in the cosmic star formation rate density and also the accretion rate density. As we move towards the present day, we see those rates decline globally. However, and this is a very crucial thing, we do see hotspots, so to speak, of high star formation and high accretion within individual galaxies. And these still play a very significant role in the gap formation and the evolution of those galaxies. The other important factor here is that they also give us in the local universe, where we look at the more extreme galaxies, a window to understand the physics that is underway in the distant universe, where we can use that to inform and address our understanding of deep observations, where we don't necessarily have the angular resolution or the detailed information from observations to infer their physical properties. This also links very closely to the co-evolution of the supermassive black hole and its accretion with the host galaxy and with the bulge initially and then out towards the wider galaxy flow. And then we also see that this links quite closely to how this star formation and accretion will be fueled by a gas accretion, outflows and so forth, and the feedback and the symbiotic relationship between the accretion and star formation with the individual galaxies. What we know is that there's also a significant role for the radio quiet AGMs as they go across all redshifts. And this is a, an area where we are still exploring by ever increasing deep observations, trying to understand the role of the low um, Eddington rate uh, radio quiet AGMs that sit in the center of these galaxies and how that evolves with the star formation that is ongoing. So the, the ultimate goal of many of this, this work is to truly, really understand how star formation and accretion evolves as a function of the universe and redshift 
but then also how the physics of that undergoes within individual galaxies, how we can use that to really try to drive our understanding. So how are we going to address this? So as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to rather unbiasedly um, push a radio angle, um, and that's going to follow through in the rest of this talk as I'm describing two radio surveys. So to get the full picture, what do we need? We need to, in the local universe, have very detailed studies to understand what the physics is underway in those local galaxies. And we need to do that on physical scales where the, those physical processes are underway, where the accretion and the jet formation is happening, where the star formation is happening and where the star evolution is happening. We need to also untangle the AGN and star formation but from each other. Now that is not as very, it's easier to do within the local universe where the resolution of our telescopes allows us to spatially separate them. But in the distant universe, we need to be able to resolve those galaxies and understand where the radio is coming from or where the AGN emission is coming from relative to the star formation. And we also need to look in the dust covered, the dust obscured hearts of these galaxies. Much, that much of the star formation in the local universe in those very intense hotspots of star formation, so to speak, is underway within the centers of galaxies where they are heavily obscured to most other wavelengths. So that really does push towards having a multi-wavelength probe, but where radio plays an increasingly key role in allowing us to penetrate that dust. So in order to do that, what we need to really understand is produce a census of what the low luminosity AGN activity in the local universe is, and what also the star formation processes are. And that will really help us to inform what is going on at the high redshift universe. What I haven't included in this slide and is another key point, which I'm not gonna address so much in this talk, is also the understanding of those intense starburst galaxies, those intense uh, luminous infrared galaxies in the local universe and how they can act as direct analogues of what we're seeing in the high redshift universe when we're seeing star formation. But that's a whole different talk. So what does this push towards? This pushes towards a multi-wavelength approach, but where we need the resolution to do galactic style, to coin a phrase, um, observations and analysis of the local galaxies and allow that to really inform and colour our understanding of what is happening in the high redshift universe. And to do that, we really need high sensitivity and crucially high resolution observations. In the small picture on the side here, I've given you an example here. Um, the, the image at the top right hand corner there is, a, is an image of the C band five centimeter radio view of M82, which is a local starburst at around three megaparsecs, two and a half megaparsecs away. And what we see in there is huge amounts of star formation processes. There isn't an AGN that is very visible within the radio here. Um, but we see lots of pockets of supernova and supernova remnants, and we're seeing the physical processes. Now, if we shift that galaxy to redshift one, that little square, and if you can see my, my curse in my hand here, that is the equivalent image at redshift one. And if we were to observe that with an interferometer such as the VLA, it's at 1.4 gigahertz L-band frequencies, what we see is an unresolved source where we cannot separate out whether there is AGN emission that is driving the radio that we're seeing or whether it is star formation. And this is really the theme of this talk that as we go out to high redshift, we need to have the resolution to separate the AGN. And as we are at low redshift, we need the resolution to truly understand the physical processes that are underway. <clears throat> Just to underscore that a little bit, and I'll come back to this a little bit later, so I'll skip over this slide quite quickly. If we look at the high redshift universe, we typically see that all of the radio sources that we are observing are around an arc second in extent, maybe a little bit less. Um, so that really just un underscores again that at high, high redshifts, we need resolutions that are in the range of um, sub arc second to milli arc seconds to allow us to separate out what's going on in the individual galaxies and then truly understand what star formation and the accretion rate in those galaxies where that is co evolving um, actually comes from. So, toolkits. So what are we going to talk about the rest of the talk? I'm going to talk about a couple of surveys, and those surveys are the eMERGE survey, where we're taking long, deep stairs at the distant universe to try and get the most sensitive observations we can. And then the Lemming survey, which is really looking at 
statistical surveys and censuses of what is going on in the local universe. And the idea of the Lemming survey is that we're able to look and um, probe down to low luminosity AGN, bridging the gap between um, supermassive black holes um, in local galaxies through to local group um, and right down to a Sagittarius A star type AGN emission. And we're going to bring those two together as we go forward. Now, I mentioned toolkits. So um, I, I, the main instrument that we're using for both of these servers is the eMerlin uh, interferometer, which is an uh, interferometer in the UK. It comprises of seven telescopes, uh, which is spread over a, a baseline length of up to 220 kilometers. Now, this is really key because this gives us the resolution that 0.2 arc seconds to 50 milli arc second resolution, depending on the observing frequency that we are looking at. Um, so just to give you some basic specifications. Um, so typically with email in we out, we can observe observations down to micro Jansky flux sensitivities within a typical observing run. Um, each of these surveys that I'm going to describe are thousands of hours of observing to give you an idea of the commitment into this program of activity. Um, <clears throat> Email in itself is a really unique SK pathfinder as well. What it does is it provides baseline lengths that are very much equivalent to the um, SK phase one deployment and also frequencies that are. So what we're seeing with Merlin is very much the same structural, the same resolution um, and the same frequency emission that we will see with the SK phase one, albeit with significantly less sensitivity. Um, so what these types of large legacy surveys that we're undertaking are really giving us a glimpse of what we will see with the SKA, albeit with more modest observing time, but we're actually seeing the SKA sky now. So that's, that's one of the really key selling points of some of this work. Um, it wouldn't be, it would be wrong for me not to also note that um, we can increase the resolution. And at the end of the talk, I'll mention some of the applications of this in this field where we can combine eMerlin and the EVN to provide an even more powerful, uh, more sensitive, higher resolution instrument, which allows us to basically really probe down to the mini arc second level. And this is where we can really start to draw out what's going on within the AGN themselves and understand those processes, even at the highest redshifts. Okay, so that was my quick introduction. Um, and. What I'm going to talk about now are a couple of the key legacy surveys within eMerlin. eMerlin itself is running 12 legacy surveys um, that cover a whole range of astrophysics from planet formation through to cosmology. Um, but in this talk, I'm going to focus on two of those talks, which are the uh, surveys, which is the Lemming survey of local galaxies, and then the eMERGE survey, which is a deep field stare of the Goods North area of the sky. Um, so I should mention also there is a third sister survey that fits in with this suite of galaxy evolution work that is being underway with e Merlin, which is the Lurgy survey, which is being led by Miguel and colleagues. Um, and that will look at luminous infrared galaxies, which bridge the gap in terms of the star formation processes between the local surveys in Lemmings through to emerge at the highest redshifts. So the local galaxy. So Lemmings, Lemmings is um, a local galaxy survey. So I'm just going to describe this now and some of the early results that are coming out from this survey now. So Lemmings, which stands for the Legacy e Merlin Multiband Imaging of Nearby Galaxy Survey, I apologize for the acronym, um, is really aiming to look at um, a representative sample of galaxies. So we have a sample of 280 galaxies that are selected on optical ground from the Palomar survey. Um, and the core aims of Lemmings are to really study the low luminosity AGN and look at the low, uh, the, look at the radio luminosity function at the lowest fluxes and really bridge the gap towards um, Sagittarius A star, star um, levels of radio emission um, right out to higher flux, higher activity galaxies. So the sample itself is representative. Um, we also have secondary goals of looking at star formation and supernova remnants within local galaxies, and also 
simultaneously observing for neutral gas content traces where we can study the dynamics and the fueling of the star formation accretion as well. The survey itself comprises of both a, a 1.5 and 5 gigahertz survey where we're reaching typical resolutions around 150 milli arc seconds at L band. I'm going to predominantly talk about the 1.5 gigahertz part of the survey, although the 5 gigahertz observations are in hand and in preparation at the moment for future science publications. Um, the survey itself is a snapshot survey. Um, we're observing for around an hour per galaxy. Um, so we have relatively modest sensitivities around 0.8 of a millijansky. However, that is still many times deeper than any other representative survey of this size. And the key advantage is the resolution because this allows us to disentangle what is going on and provides a spatial filter where we're actually removing the diffuse emission and seeing the core active galactic nuclei emission in the center, but also the compact star formation products. Aligned with the survey, we also have a deep survey that is looking at a, a small subset of galaxies, but with um, a sensitivity that is of all, an order of magnitude deeper. So the plots on the on the right hand side here show our initial survey survey results, which basically shows the the core luminosities in the radio versus distance and, and so forth. And um, as you can see there, the sample itself is not a distance limited sample, it's not complete any one distance, but it's an optical luminosity based um, sample criteria. And we have galaxies going out to just over 100 megaparsecs, but our, our median redshift, median distance range is around 20 megaparsecs. So, this is the specifications of the sample, as I've just described many of them. But one of the key things I'd like to just highlight is this covers a wide range of galaxy types. So this comes covers um, active or active galaxies as defined in optical emission lines, for instance, in the form of stafets and liners, but then also a wide range of non-active galaxies in H2 regions, absorption line galaxies, and so forth. And we have a big range of central mass, central black hole masses within our sample between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 9 solar masses. Um, the sensitivity of this, we're um, basically down at the 10 to the 17.6 uh, level at 1.5 gigahertz. The sample itself being a nearby galaxy, um, well covered nearby galaxy sample has a very, very strong multi wavelength component. And that is something that we within the Lemmings Consortium are slowly building up as well. And I'll touch upon a few of those things too. Okay, so science aims. So as I've already alluded to, to some extent, one of the first science aims is to look at the census of the low luminosity aging emission. So this has been presented in, in a number of a sequence of papers that are um, on archive and available at the moment, uh, which are presenting the initial 1.4 five gigahertz survey, along with um, multi wavelength diagnostics and um, an analysis of just the nuclear region of the galaxy. One thing I wanted to underline here is that the observations we have have a very wide field of view in theory, um, and they allow us to observe um, an area that is around 30 arc minutes in extent around every single pointing of these galaxies. The initial analysis is only really looking at the central few arc seconds. So we're looking at really looking at the low the AGN content within the center of these galaxies in this phase one. So um, just to give you a, a pictorial example, so this is this is an example of, of a few of our sources that we're seeing, and this really underlines the complexity in the structures that we see. Now this is um, snapshot imaging with a limited radio array that only has seven telescopes so we are limited by to some degree by image fidelity however what we're seeing consistently is a range of structures from core jets to triples um, to much more complex star formation related structures within the center of these galaxies um, just to give you the headline results from that sample so the sample itself, which was 280 galaxies um, and optically selected, so with no bias towards a radio pre-selection and detection rate, we detect around 50% of them, 45% or so um, in the radio within the central one and a bit arc seconds. So this is really looking at the core emission only. The range of sources detected, um, we 
detect almost all of the ciphers that are in our sample, and a large and a good fraction of the liners in H2 galaxies, as well as and also some of the absorption line galaxies, which show less activity in the center of these sources. Um, so in total, around 40% have detections of radio cores. The radio jet structure ranges from a few kiloparsecs out to, to a few thousand kiloparsecs. And we also detect a series of a new subclass of AGM, which are H2 diagnostic galaxies that show H2 optical diagnostics, but also show some radio jet emission on the 100 to 1000 milliarp second scales. This work is all being followed up at C-band and various other wavelengths, including LOFAR and EBN and various, various areas in the future. Um, so when we break that down, we can see here, um, just looking at the luminosity, the radio luminosity is a function of the types of galaxies that we are looking at. We see a, a range of luminosities. The liners themselves in particular show a great deal of interest because they spread between um, star formation and AGN content as do the H2 galaxies, where we see this subclass of, of H2 galaxies that show radio signatures of AGM. If we start to then look at that uh, radio core flux density and luminosity in the center there, we can use the radio as a probe of the nuclear activity, as a probe of the, the power of the AGM to a large extent. And this is one of the really important factors of using radio as a method of studying this, because it is highly sensitive to the activity that is going on in terms of the jet formation, the accretion rate, and the, and the black hole um, AGM emission. Um, and this was the, one of the main reasons to drive us for the original project was to really, really try and produce a, an unbiased census of that AGN emission. And we're also unobscured to the dust and so forth, so we, we don't have those issues. Um, so on the right hand side here, we see one of the initial results, um, which is really just plotting the, the black hole mass versus the radio core luminosity. The key trends we see here is that we are starting to see this dichotomy between the star formation dominated galaxies and the AGN dominated galaxies within this sample now. So we see a trend that above 10 uh, solar mass, uh, uh, supermassive, solar, um, supermassive black hole solar mass of around 10 to the 6.5, we're seeing a trend of the AGN emission. Um, as traced by the radio versus the black hole mass. And then we see a break below those three, uh, that, that mass range where we're seeing a more star formation domination of the radio emission in the galaxies. This is pretty much what we may have expected as we see that the star formation and the AGN activity will be co-evolving in these galaxies. And we're seeing this as a continuum where the A star formation becomes the dominant component below a certain black hole mass. Now, when we have to look a little bit deeper into what the accretion rates and the Eddington, Eddington ratios of those sources are to truly understand that. So, um, and just to underscore one point before I move on, um, what we're sensitive to here um, in a conservative um, sensitivity limit around six sigma, what we're sensitive is to sources that are um, moderate to high brightness temperatures. So these are true AGNs, and we're starting to see sensitivity at the lower, lower flux levels into the star formation regime. Okay, so now we can look use those results to look a bit harder at the AGN population. Now, if we start to plot the black hole mass, and this is the, the same picture from the previous slide on the right-hand side, we can see these two sequences of star formation-driven versus AGN-driven emission. This corresponds quite naturally to the bulge mass, of course, which is exactly what we'd expect because these galaxies follow an M sigma relationship in general where the bulge mass is related to the black hole mass. And we see this in the left hand plot here, which is using HST imaging to do a spectral decomposition of the bulge versus the bar and various other components within the optical galaxy itself or the optical observations of the galaxy. And we see this same confirmation of this break between the star forming galaxies and the AGN galaxies. It is quite notable that not all of the traditionally defined 
star formation or AGN, um, optically classified galaxies, and we, we use a, a classical BPT type emission classification for the galaxies, follow those trends. And we see exceptions, whether it be these jetted H2 regions or liners that show more star formation like properties in the radio. We can follow that through, and, and this is somewhat future work, is by then also looking at how that black hole activity uh, relates to accretion, and, and we can plot that onto a fundamental plane. Um, so one of the new pieces of work that is coming out in, in preparation at the moment is that we're following up this radio sample with a near complete sample of Chandra observations to really trace the X-ray as a tracer of the nuclear activity as well. And this will allow us to really pin the fundamental plane down across a range of lower luminosities. So this is work in progress. Um, but what we're seeing is this trend where we see the, the change to star formation. If we plot this on a fundamental plane, um, and this the right hand plot here, um, or the left hand plot to start with, is here where we're using O3 as a proxy for the accretion rate um, of the AGN itself. Um, and we can plot that against the radio core luminosity. And we're seeing that these galaxies follow the fundamental plane of accretion where we're assuming the O3 connection to the X ray or to the accretion rate in general. Um, plotting that and breaking that down as a function of the black hole mass accretion rate and the radio flux, we see this in the right hand side here, where we're seeing the majority of our AGN dominated galaxies, the safer it's the radio loud AGN, following the classical trend. But we see this deviation, um, which it follows on from exactly the same deviation we saw in the previous plot, where we're seeing more star formation dominated sources as well as a combination of fainter, low luminosity, jetted AGN that are sitting in the center of these, of the H2 galaxies as well. So that, that's where that is moving. Um, now we're just in the process of, of completing this work where we're bringing together both the O3 as a proxy, the X-ray Chandra observations, where we have this new survey of 213 of our 280 galaxies in the sample to really try and connect the origins of this nuclear mission. But following on from that, just to give you a glimpse of some of the work that we're doing at the moment within the Chandra survey, we can also look at how the these different types of galaxies, be it the liners, say if it's or absorption line galaxies or H2 galaxies, fit within this plane of black hole mass x-ray luminosity, which is a good proxy for the accretion, um, and then also where they fit within the Eddington ratios um, that we're plotting, the Eddington luminosity ratios. And we see that these fit within certain areas, but we're seeing this trend that the H2 regions do follow, but a slightly um, different uh, profile in terms of the fit to that, um, that work. So we see a range of typically high and low accretion rates. Okay, so that was the Lemming Statistical Survey, and just in one slide, because I want to get onto the, the more distant universe as well. Um, the other science goals from Lemmings um, are also to look at star formation. So one of the things that we are doing now as a second phase of, of Lemmings, and also as part of the Lemmings Deep program, is to look at star formation and also low luminosity AGN again, but at a factor of 10 or more deeper. So there's a number of works that I haven't got time to go through in, in, in detail at this moment in time um, that are looking at individual galaxies within that framework. Um, one of my particular pet sources is MH2, um, and this is part of the Lemming survey. And one of the things we are looking at at the moment is what the variability of the individual compact sources within, H, in, within MH2, which is a pure star forming galaxy, um, I'll tell us about the, the star formation rates and the supernova rates. Um, so the, the resolution, the exquisite re resolution of the EMO and then these surveys is allowing us to resolve the individual supernova sources. The bottom picture here is a composite JBLA plus e observation of MH2 at C-band. Um, 
if we zoom in and, and just utilize the email in data alone, that allows us to really separate out and count the individual supernova remnants. And this is part of the one of the goals of lemmings across the wider census of galaxies that we're serving, is that the depth of the shallow survey will allow us to detect essentially all of the type two supernova um, remnants of type two supernovas. Um, out to um, several tens of megaparsecs um, that are above a typical cascade type luminosity. So this will allow us to basically decompose those individual galaxies and count the number of supernova remnants which are long lived, hundreds of years lived to thousands of years, um, and actually use that to infer the supernova rate and therefore the star formation rate via an independent proxy. Um, so this is one of the areas that we're slowly extending within the statistical survey, but to do that we're first of all looking at the deep survey to really try and probe down how far down the luminosity range of supernova and compact star formation products, and that includes H2 regions, um, can we probe. Emirates 2 is a great example where if we look at those top three images, what we see at, at 1.5 gigahertz is a series of compact radio supernova and then when we increase the frequency range and go up to five gigahertz we're seeing those supernova still at higher resolution where we can resolve the individual morphologies of these supernova seeing their rings as they're expanding but then also the breakouts from those rings which are really allowing us to probe the inhomogeneous interstellar medium within those galaxies but then also pull out the uh, the H2 regions is that have a much flatter spectrum and uh, become much more evident at the higher frequencies. So that's a lot of work in progress. The deep survey of lemmings really covers a range of sources. We have selected a few sources with the best wavelength coverage and particular areas of interest, ranging from AGN such as NGC 4151 as a classical safer through to sources like M82 or IC10 to cover both the dwarf and the star formation rates within a variety of galaxies, which will allow us to fill that low sense, low flux density pit part of the survey that sits under, sits in, a, in sits below the uh, the statistical sample. So this is allowing us to do, as I said in my introduction slide, like galactic style physics within individual galaxies. Okay, just to summarise lemmings and where we're going. Um, so at the moment, we've, we're looking at the low luminosity AGN is a particular focus where we're drawing together this radio statistical samples. There's been a number of papers already underway. The next papers that are coming are looking at the optical and radio connections relative to the bulge, relative to the fundamental plane. And then also the Chandra sample, which is a key complement to the radio and the optical studies that we've started already. So the Chandra sample itself covers 85% of the entire lemming sample, so it becomes representative. Um, and we have around a 60 to 70% detection rate of the compact sources within the center of the nuclear compact sources. Following on from that, we also have the, the deep C-band observations that are coming, which will probe those nuclear regions, but at higher resolution and allow us to really separate out the AGN in more detail. And then also looking at the fundamental plane, the off-nuclear sources, and then crucially that is just coming through now, a, a full analysis of the HST observations of the entire sample on the basis of archival data, where we're doing multi-component uh, decomposition of the, of the light profiles of those galaxies to try and pull apart the role of the bar, the bulge, and how that links to the AGN emission as probed in the optical light as well as the radio. Following that further, there's a wider multi wavelength component that is, is in process from, from the infrared through to uh, through to the radio as well. Okay, um, so that is all coming. Um, one of the key focuses of the next six months is really to deliver that data via a science platform that allows open access to all of the uh, the individual sources and all of the multi wavelength data on this uh, this this board. Okay, so in the last uh, 20, 25 minutes or so of the talk, I'm going to just probe a little bit deeper um, and talk a little bit about the high redshift universe and how this connects. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about the eMERGE survey, which is the second of these email and surveys that we're going to talk about today. So the eMERGE survey, which uh, the initial results were published in Max Loretto 2020, and I highly recommend that paper for reading, albeit it is quite long. Um, the eMERGE survey is a, is a tiered email in JBLA plus EVN legacy program. Um, what we're doing in that program is utilising the sensitivity and the field of view that we can obtain with the email in array um, to probe the individual sources within the Goods North field. So in total, we have over a thousand hours of observing, um, much of which has already been undertaken at L-band, um, one to two gigahertz. Um, where we're basically taking a single deep stare to produce what is probably one of the deepest radio observations to date, and certainly the deepest radio observations at these resolutions, this fifth of an arc second resolution. In the first data release, which I'm going to talk about some of the results from, um, we are only actually including 25% of our radio data, and that is because this is a mammoth job to analyse the data itself um, and within that that 25 percent of the email and data we have combined with vla data as well and we're down at the uh, current sensitivity around the microjansky so this is basically a glimpse of the sk sky as will be seen everywhere the sk points the central region which we have imaged is around 15 arc minutes um, so this is a very wide field imaging problem um, but the latter second data release, which we are currently working on, is looking at to image the full field of view of the telescopes, which is around 30 arc minutes. Um, and also significantly more data, which will more than half the uh, sensitivity compared to these results. Now, why is this important? Now, there are many, many telescopes that are doing uh, large area or narrow area and deep extragalactic observations and deep fields. Uh, we all know of many of these uh, famous deep field areas, whether that be the Cosmos field or the Goods North field that I'm talking about here. So the typical representation of these is to, to plot the sensitivity, the limiting sensitivity versus the area covered for the survey. Um, and this is this left-hand plot here. What you can see is there is a general trend of surveys which basically is dictated by the technology that is available, the sensitivity of the telescopes and the field of view that they can obtain, but ultimately how much time you can obtain through an open allocation process. So the revolution has been with the SKA pathfinders where instruments such as um, ASCAP, which is doing the EMU large area survey, up in this top left hand corner are able to cover very, very large areas or where Meerkat, for instance, is able to produce incredibly sensitive over still very large area surveys such as the Mighty survey. Now, where does eMERGE fit within this play? Now, eMERGE is a relatively narrow field of view. Um, however, it is incredibly deep. So we sit right at the bottom left hand corner of this, this plot, um, modest areas, in reality, far, far lower than, say, Mighty and far, far lower than, say, EMU. Um, however, we're sitting at a very high sensitivity regime. Now, the key point of difference is if you flip this diagram on a different axis and you've got resolution. Um, and hopefully the first half of the talk is really giving you an idea why the resolution is key. Um, so if we flip this across and we plot resolution here of the instruments and these surveys, so eMERGE sits in this central area where we're basically plotting um, sub arc second that we're sensitive to many, many arc seconds with our shortest spacing VLA data that we're complementing the email and with right the way through to sub arc second data. So this links and bridges between VLBI style surveys, which we'll talk about right at the end, and VLA surveys that are underway, such as the Cosmos surveys, um, or the Lockman Hole surveys, and also um, SK Pathfinder surveys such as MITEI, which have much coarser resolution but are able to go to higher area and high depth. So, in very quick terms, what were the first results from the eMERGE survey? So, within the limited scope that we have of the data that we're publishing, the first data releases, 
Uh, we've imaged this 15 art minute field, and we have just over 850 sources that are detected at high, high signal to noise ratio. And we're putting a very conservative six plus um, sigma uh, threshold on this. Now, the real unique application of the eMERGE series that is allows us to image at a range of spatial scales. Now, the important thing to do is to understand that we can image from arc second scales where we can see the global emission within the galaxy using the VLA as part of our survey, right the way through to email and resolutions where we're resolving away the diffuse emission that is seen the faint diffuse star formation related emission. And we're able to really pull out the AGN cores and the intense areas of star formation in the the high star formation rate uh, Minerva type sources, the uh, sub millimeter sources, and so forth at high redshift. So, the main undertaking of the emergent survey is to really produce a, a suite of data that ranges from those arc second through to those sub mini arc second resolutions in right down to the VLBI scales. So, just to just give you um, a quick pictorial, I can't show 850 individual sources, of course, but to give you a quick pictorial example of some of those sources. So, the grid of of images there from left to right shows individual galaxies where we're changing the resolution as a function of the galaxy type and as a function of the um, data that we're putting into the imaging process. And this allows us to really then pin down the size measurements for all of the individual galaxies. Every single galaxy in our survey bar one, in fact, is resolved. Um, and that allows us to basically probe the radio emission structure which shows that the radio sources are at the few to 10 kiloparsec scale, right out to quite high redshifts and redshifts of five and a half to six where we're detecting our sources. We have exceptions to that and we have certain galaxies such as this uh, ID156, which is our one, two, three, fifth source on this line, which show radio loud structures. But this field in particular has been chosen to have very few radio loud galaxies in it. So we have one FR1 and one FR2. So this is the key results that we're measuring the size. Now it is interesting then compare the size to say the Hubble Space Telescope um, sizes, which is comparable resolution at optical wavelengths and in the red wave. Wavelengths, near UV light wavelengths, um, which shows that we're seeing a flatter distribution of sizes from the, the radio compared to the one-to-one uh, -one relationship you might expect. And this is really pinning down that what we're seeing here is lots of small, low luminosity aging pores embedded within star formation as well. So Back to that first plot that I showed you at the beginning, this is just the size analysis, a preliminary size analysis from about a quarter of our sample. And this is really pinning down that we're seeing lots of small AGN core jets, slightly bigger star forming galaxies, and then we're seeing a small subset of classical AGN structures, the FR1s, FR2s. And it really understands. I underlines again the importance of having this sub second resolution, the importance of having um, radio observations that allow us to actually separate out what's going on. Um, I've heard the quote many times, there's nothing as, nothing as useless as a single radio source. And if you have an unresolved radio source, we uh, in these fields, we have without multi wavelength or without structural information, it's very hard to determine whether they are we're looking at AGN emission or star formation emission, which means ultimately we can't use the radio as a diagnostic of what star formation rate density or the accretion rate density as a function of redshift. So, to give you a few examples, just to show the detail and the quality and the sensitivity of these data, this is an example of a, a pure star forming galaxy or, or a mostly star forming galaxy at about redshift 1.2 or 1.1. 1 .1. um, and this is looking at the using the radio emission as a proxy, we're able to measure the star formation rate. And roughly this is a, a thousand solar masses per year star forming galaxy, which follows the optical structure of the merge, merging galaxy that we see in the candles data, which is in the top left hand corner of this, this montage. And we see the radio emission follows this structure. Now, rather interestingly, uh, if we then take extremely deep, comparable depth, um, higher frequency radio observations, and, and the bottom right hand of the four panels there shows the 
X-band observations by Eric Murphy and colleagues of the same field. This has comparable depth, comparable spatial dense, spatial and sensitivity to structures. Um, what we're seeing is that the radio structures at those higher frequencies are smaller. Um, and that is really to do with the propagation of the cosmic rays through those, those galaxies. So we're seeing them, and these are very luminous, luminous star forming galaxies. Now, if we can, if we extend that assessment of that one source as an example, and we plot the sources that are detected at X band in deep observations versus the sources we're detecting at one and a half gigahertz, um, and we plot those source like for like sources, so not samples, just looking at individual galaxies, what we find is in this, this graph at the bottom here, we find that typically the radio sizes of the higher decreases as a function of the higher frequency. And this is true for both the AGN and the star forming galaxies, but it's primarily true for the star forming galaxies. And this is exactly what we would expect. We see the star formation rate, star formation is traced um, to, is more compact, or what, what we're tracing the observation is more compact rather. Um, at the higher frequencies in these star forming galaxies. This is about a factor of 10 times smaller. Okay, um, so I mentioned at the very beginning, one of the goals is really to try and understand co evolution as well of star formation and creation. Um, and that is a, that's a, a major thing. And the low lim, uh, local universe lemming sample is starting to probe that by looking at the low luminosity AGN sensors. But at the high redshift, what we can do is really, really try and understand and use the high resolution image data to spatially separate out these AGN. And this is just one example here where we have a, a emerging system that we're observing. This is a, a uh, redshift of 1.6, uh, no, not redshift of 1.6, redshift of, of one or so, or half, actually, so, um, where we're seeing um, compact AGN emission within, surrounded by this star formation process that you know, is ongoing in these galaxies. Um, and this is something that we're increasing our investigation on by in, um, complementing our existing 1.5 gigahertz data with our newer deep fields that are coming to that C band and higher frequencies, where we can begin to separate that even further. Okay, so just to really underline here, what we have is that at email and resolutions, we can see both the star formation and the aging. Now, to really pull back our answers, what we want to do is try and measure the amount of use the radio as a proxy of the star formation and of the AGN emission across all redshift ranges. And to do that, we need to spatially separate out. And for galaxies such as the one you can see here, we can use the emailing resolutions to spatially separate out the AGN and the star formation. Um, and then we can measure the radio flux of the, that is observed, determine how much is down to the radio emission from the AGN and how much is the star formation, and use that to chart the star formation rate. However, it is really important to try and understand what the AGN population is and to try and separate the pure AGN star formation. So in the last minute and a half or so of this talk, I just wanted to just highlight some of the work that is ongoing in the BLBI area, where we can use new wide field BLBI techniques, where we crank the resolution up to the milli arc second scales and allows us to spatially separate out the high brightness temperature sources, which are the ones that are sensitive to, and use VLBI techniques as a spatial filter used to their advantage that we don't have the short baselines and therefore we are not sensitive to the diffuse emission just to pinpoint and pick out the AGN. So this is a survey work that has been undertaken recently and, and further publications have been published this year on this. Um, looking at the Goods North fields, so the same field as the Emerge, but using the EVN to obtain very deep observations. And this is basically allows us to pinpoint all of the radio AGN that are in there, which we can then use to remove from our Emerge sample to get a clean understanding of what the star formation rate is going on. So your BI is a great diagnostic. Now, there are many other multi wavelength ways of diagnosing um, AGN presence, whether that be uh, infrared colors, um, radio excess, um, X-ray emission, and so forth. And we talked about those a little bit before. 
But what VLBI does is it gives us a clean handle of what the radio emission of the energy in is, and, and that's what we've been looking at as well. Albeit it is quite expensive on time and lots of data and lots of effort. So how does this sort of technique perform? And I'm not going to talk about this in depth because I haven't got time today, but really I just wanted to underline that VLBI provides a really unique way of just pulling out and pinpointing the AGM content right out to the distant universe. Um, all of the VLBI sources that we detect have other AGM diagnostics, but what is very clear when you look at the details are that many of the other AGM diagnostics um, don't always capture all of the AGM. So you need a wide range of multi-wavelength tools to be able to identify the full range of, VLBI, of AGM within any field. However, once, if you're using the radio as a diagnostic star formation or accretion, what we're interested in is the radio emitting AGM. So we're interested in the radio excess sources and we're interested in the ones with the high virus temperature cores, which we use built the eye to probe. So it really underlines the importance of bringing this wide range of multi resolution scales and images of galaxies into the fore to try and understand what the separation of star formation and accretion, which is the core topic of the work that we're doing at the moment. So just to very quickly summarize, um, the radio gives us a very unique view of star formation and accretion. Um, the lemming sample in the local universe is allowing us to do resolved studies of individual galaxies, separate out star formation regions, separate H2 regions with known and so forth. But most importantly at the moment is is giving us a much more complete understanding of what the radio emission from the low luminosity AGM is doing and how that links with the galaxies around that, how that co-evolves with the bulge, how the supermassive black hole and the accretion rates um, contribute to galaxy evolution. The aim of the Lemmings survey ultimately is to provide that ground truth at redshift zero to really inform the radio surveys at, at higher redshifts. Um, that is an ongoing process, um, but what we are seeing is this prevalence of low luminosity AGN and also the transition as we go to lower and lower black hole mass into a more star formation dominated processes. Now that's not to say star formation isn't there, it's for in the larger mass sources, it's more to say that the AGN emission is dominated. Um, what has become abundantly clear is we need this multi-resolution, multi-wavelength view, this is not something new, this is not something that we don't all know, but it is worth really understating again. And of course, the SK and NGBLA will really revolutionize this field as we go forward. So at high redshift, we're seeing a very similar picture. We're seeing able to resolve and separate these individual sources. We can't see the individual physical processes going on in the same detail, of course, but we can start to separate out the star formation and the energy emission. Um, one of the things that take home messages I always have in this area of this is that the star forming galaxies are quite small um, in the radio. The Microjansky star formation galaxy population, once we get to below a few tens of Microjanskys in deep fields, these are dominating the star, uh, dominated by star formation gal um, galaxies and radio quiet quasars as well, um, are small. They're typically sub arc second to an arc second in extent. Um, so if we want to separate out what's going on and not just see a single blob, we need to have that very high resolution. So resolution is a critical diagnostic in our armory of trying to separate out what's going on in galaxies. And if we can ultimately get a clean view of the cosmic star formation history, we need to determine it in the unobscured regime as well as uh, as well as other diagnostics and we need to truly separate out what the AGN and the star formation mission in each of those galaxies is and that's where I will finish so thank you very much. Thank you very much Rob for this very nice talk and uh, now the talk is open for questions for uh, doing that please raise your hand and uh, I will introduce Dr. Javier Modon. He will manage the uh, questions. So please, Javier, do it. Thank you. And thank you, Rob, for the very interesting talk. So I think the first question, the first hand I see is uh, from Isabel. So please, Isabel, go ahead. Okay. 
So uh, thank you very much, Rob. It's been an incredibly interesting talk. Uh, so th thanks a lot. With, with many um, interest um, from my own field of view. So I, I, that's that may be one of the reasons why I, I found it very, very interesting. So I have a couple of questions, even, even three, but the short ones, uh, not, not to um, monopolize all the, the discussion. First one is that you said that you you have uh, liners in the in lemmings uh, showing star, high star formation rates, right? Yeah, moderate. So, uh, no, not so moderate. Small. Okay, so but because I, we, we've been working on liners for a long time already, and and um, I'd like to know whether you have some difference uh, between those showing even moderate uh, star formation rates with all with, with those in, within I mean liners, um, showing very low star formation rates because that that might be a connection with interacting objects. So I, I'd like to. Yeah, no, it's, the the connection with interacting objects is something that we we're trying to address. Mm -hmm. via the HST work because by allowing us to decompose the uh, light profiles we can look for signatures of previous interactions and mm -hmm. so on and so forth and um, so that's something that is still coming um, but you're you're exactly right and um, trying to look at the continuum of star formation as a function of the different classes and also the AGN emission and trying to separate them out they're the two things that we really want to do the star formation probe um, at the moment, because we've looked primarily at the core only, and we've ex we've excluded the rest of the galaxy, and that is that's not by design. That was just by practicality, really, more than anything else, because it's a big job. And what we're starting to do is extend our imaging across wide fields of view, so we can use the radio as a diagnostic of the historic star formation by looking at the star formation products, um, but then also compare that to the Spitzer and Herschel star formation rates where we have the full or the majority about 65 70 percent of the sample have got Herschel and Spitzer observations albeit at much coarser angular scales but they'll give us a, a better diagnosis of the star formation as a whole that then we can link back to the lines so I don't have an answer right now for you but that is exactly the, the continuum of, of work that we want to go on to so one thing I'm very very keen to do is to take the wide field radio aspect, the Spitzer Herschel star formation rate diagnostics, and then compare that to what the AGN activity is doing as well to try and join that, that process together. So, yes. Okay, uh, thank you. And, and concerning the, the uh, X ray data, mm -hmm. uh, do you have any way of knowing how or which ones of the targets you have are Compton thick with X rays? Um, not yet. Um, we're just in the process of getting some new or obtaining some new star data as well to try and give us the harder x ray. Um, but I, I, we don't have that quite yet. Okay. And, and the, very, the very last question is concerning the high redshift AGN. Um, are you able to sample the same kind of AGN we see locally in the sense of having access to low luminosity AGN? Not quite. Not quite. But we're getting there. Um, uh, we are. <laughs> We're almost at the safer, uh, bright end of the safer at uh, the redshift of, of one ish, uh, but it's right on the cusp of our sensitivity. Um, so that's why actually we need to push the sensitivity down by another factor of two to three, which will then really bridge us into out to at least out to 0.7 of a redshift or so, maybe to one. Then we'll start to see that um, because at the moment we're really in the star formation sensors, we're at the the sort of 100 plus star formation rates um, that we're seeing. Um, and similarly with the AGM, we're not quite at the, the low luminosity AGM scales. Okay. Uh, yeah, because I'm interested in low luminosity, so that, that's why. Thank you. No, Thank you very much, Rob, again. Uh, it's just very hard, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Thank you. Okay. Um, if anyone has any other question, please raise your hand or let me know in the chat. Uh, I don't see any now, so otherwise I would ask uh, Rob if you can comment or, or say your uh, your insights on potential synergies in the future between Emerlin and and the SKA pathfinders or even the SKA precursors in the southern hemisphere. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so there's, there's quite a lot of synergies. Um, so email in itself um, is has very similar. Uh, sensitivity ranges in, in terms of spatial scales, frequencies, and so forth to 
the ESCO. Um, we basically track the, the ESCO frequency bands and we have the same resolution. So one of the projects that is very much underway is linking together the roles of things like MITE with Meerkat um, to other surveys with BLBI, with email and so forth. Um, and there's various projects um, which are looking at taking this extra galactic deep field approach of observing the same patches of sky with as many of the precursors and pathfinder instruments as possible. Um, and partly that is to try and link together this multi-resolution, multi-frequency view of what we're seeing, but also the technical aspect of trying to understand the, the spatial scale sensitivities and, and the calibration routines and everything else between those different instruments. So there's a number of fields that are underway at the moment. Um, Cosmos is one of them because everyone wants to look at Cosmos. Um, but then also other fields that can be um, addressed with various instruments such as Apatif or ASCAP and so forth. Um, so that is one area. The other area that is, is quite key in this sort of development is really trying to understand the, how we will calibrate SK data, for instance, in the future. Um, and because eMoMIN is, is a, a unique pathfinder that covers the same spatial scales, but with far, far less telescopes and far, far less data, we can use this to our absolute advantage in the sense that we can use the same techniques and the same software that we will use under STP with the SKA to calibrate email and data. But instead of only being able to do it in a single pass once and the data not being available to really recalibrate, we can do that multiple times to try and optimize our workflows and so forth. So that's another area that we're very closely working on in terms of both providing a science and a technical pathfinder for the SK and for the NIRCAR as well. Um, one of the areas we would like to do and we're working on is developing higher frequency observation, the higher frequency capabilities or middle frequency capabilities for email that match some of the high frequency bands of the SK, so the band five regime as well. Um, so those are areas that we're working on. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Anchon has raised his hand, so Anchon, go ahead. Yeah, hi Javier, hi Rob, thanks a lot for the nice talk. Let me ask you some details about the beautiful EPN image of the cosmos field in which you detect such a large number of sources. Can you give me details about the number of hours and details also on the calibration? If you don't mind, how do you perform the... Yeah, um, so, so this is the Goods North field. Um, so we have in those observations that I presented, we, in total we have about a thousand hours of LBAN data um, and around uh, 50 or so hours of BLA data in multiple configurations, uh, go from C array through to A array. Um, so those data are, have all been calibrated um, through, through various bits of CASA pipeline and we combine the data in the UV plane. Uh, between the different arrays um, and then that data is, is thus we have first of all have a series of interesting problems in terms of making sure that we have common flux scales we have to account for the variability across the field of view of the individual sources as well um, within the wide field of view uh, if i go back a couple of slides so let's see mm -hmm. what this picture two seconds there so this picture on the on the right hand side here gives is, a, is our rms map for instance mm -hmm. of this field um this is only the central field um so what you know there is we've got two patches of high rms and that's down to two particularly perniciously annoying sources um they're not very bright you know these are tens to 50 milli Jansky sources so they're, they're relatively low brightness However, the, certainly the one at the top shows a degree of variability, which means that actually doing a, a subtraction of that source across our multiple epochs, which are observed over a period of, of years, um, it becomes very difficult. Um, and also that sits um, towards the, getting towards the, not quite at the half power by any stretch of the imagination, but it's, it's closer to the half power of the level telescope. Uh, which, that, which gives us problems in, in actually subtracting it across. So what we've done is we've taken the, the multiple data sets of the array and we've, we've combined them using 
different weighting schemes to allow us to um, really probe the different resolution scales. Um, so that's weighting down the VLA data relative to its true sensitivity and relative to the email data. So that becomes particularly important um, because of the PSF structure of the array um, as well, because what we would find otherwise is we get a very central, where we get a very um, a PSF structure that has very high shoulders relative to the central peak of the array. So that, that is another big factor. Um, we're just in the process of writing a, a paper on, on exactly that subject as a technical note because it is a really relevant, relevant issue for many arrays that exist, Meerkat, for example, SK1, MOFAR, and so forth, which have high century concentration of, of dishes relative to a sparser non baseline array. Um, anyway, so I, I digress a little bit, um, but what we we then do is we we pass the data through. We we using typically using WS Queen as our, our wide field imaging routine. The problem is these very large fields of view take huge amounts of memory to efficiently process imaging. Um, we're, we're running on typically the one and a half to three terabyte um, well, machines. Um, which allow us to, to then do that deconvolution and imaging in a, in a reasonably efficient way. It's going to take a very long time. And that's actually going to be a delay of this. Um, we have already averaged the data down to try and mitigate the problem, but it, it still is a large issue. So in our DR2, we're reanalyzing the data with um, four times the spectral resolution, which allows us to have reduced smearing at the outside of the field and increasing the field out to 30 arc minutes. This first field was around 15 arc minutes in size. So we're significantly increasing the problem that we have, both in terms of the primary beam correction and also how we do the imaging, which um, yeah, is going to be computationally challenging. Mm -hmm. So that probably doesn't answer your question because there's actually a huge amount of things that we have done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Rob. Thank you, Anton. I don't know, Isabel, if you have raised your hand again. Yeah, yeah, I have. Uh, it's coming back to Lemon. So, um, yeah. Because I was wondering how the X ray data from the jetted H2 galaxies uh, are. Yeah. Um, absolutely. I, unfortunately, I can't give you the answer because we haven't analysed that bit yet or haven't separated it out. Um, the uh, the X-ray paper is is we have an initial X-ray sample paper which is looking at the general statistics, um, mm -hmm. but I haven't looked at separating it out yet. Um, that's that's the next job. It's a relatively small subset of uh, a few galaxies, half a dozen. Yeah, maybe because it'd be it'd be interesting to to I mean to have an idea of how different wavelengths give uh, provide different information on yeah. on AGN. Yeah. So it'd be fine to find uh, I mean point sources at X-rays for those uh, galaxies. Yeah, no, absolutely. That that's one of the real things we want to do, and also the absorption line galaxies that show some nuclear emission as well. And um, we want to bring that in. Um, so I've got a PhD student at the moment who's just starting to work on the absorption line galaxies in particular, um, but then the jet energy regions and the natural consequence thereafter. Um, but that is still very much in, in work. Um, and yeah, it's, it's taken a little bit of time. Unfortunately, the person that uh, has been working on some of the X-ray data is, is uh, stuck in India with various COVID-related situations that have delayed as well. So, but, okay. It's thank coming. You. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and thank you again. That's okay. <laughs> thank you, Isabel, for the question. So I think we don't have any more questions. So um, yeah, I don't see any, any others. So I think we can end the seminar, the colloquium here, Rene. Yes, thank you, Javier, for this uh, managing the question. And yeah, thank you very much, Rob, this week for this marvelous talk, for everybody for doing the, the question and answers. And uh, hope we, uh, we can see here in Granada next time. Yeah. Yeah, we do, we, we do expect so. Yeah. <laughs>